This problem will never be easier to solve than it was yesterday, and the second best day to solve it is, you know, today. You haven't really asked me about transportation. Oh, well, we should talk about transportation. Or bedrooms are for people. I love talking about bedrooms. I could talk about bedrooms are for people all, all day. <laughs> Hello Boulder and the wider world. This is the Sharing Boulder podcast. My name is Philip Ogren, and for episode 13, I sat down with Lauren Folkerts in South Boulder to talk about her candidacy for Boulder City Council. Lauren is passionate about City Council and jokes that it is like a spectator sport for her because she enjoys watching the meetings online and follows them on Twitter. Lauren showed me her garden and I enjoyed a handful of raspberries as we walked through her neighborhood to a nearby park where we sat and talked about a wide variety of issues, including housing, building codes, transportation, social services, and bedrooms are for people, among others. A favorite moment of the evening for me was after the interview when we geeked out over her Van Moof e-bike, which is wicked cool. I appreciate Lauren's thoughtful and inclusive approach to problem solving and I admire her depth of knowledge on a wide variety of topics that we discussed. We hope you enjoyed this episode with Lauren Folkerts. Lauren, welcome to Sharing Bowler. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, maybe just give a, a, a brief introduction. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Um, so my name is Lauren Folkerts. I'm an architect in Boulder, and I am running for city council. Hurrah. Yes, thank you for running. I mean. Seriously, thank you for running. Like, I understand that uh, it's not going to be easy and, uh, you know, you're going to have a lot of uh, demands on your time. So that's a huge uh, commitment to public service. I really appreciate it. Um, so how is the campaign going? The campaign is, is going. So this is definitely the first time I have done something like this. Yep. Um, and, and it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... Uh, you have a website up and you're, you're I, accepting donations or did you max out yet? I have not maxed okay. out yet. I am yeah. still accepting donations. I have hit my city match. I just picked up my city match nice. check on t earlier today, this oh, morning, cool. which was pretty exciting. City exciting. cuts you a yeah. pretty good size. And do you, have, uh, do you have yard signs and stickers and stuff? I yeah. get my yard signs on Wednesday. Okay. Um, I am having a party tomorrow. Right. Um, that sounds really fun. I'm excited about maybe escaping the orbit of my house tomorrow to come to join you. Um, so maybe just tell me a little bit about what you've learned about uh, running for public office so far. It really takes a village. <laughs> I sort of didn't expect how much um, I would need to ask of other people to help me do this. It's not not just um, fundraising, but in terms of, you know, all the mechanics of putting together a campaign of, uh, you know, there's a million marketing pieces and um, I am not a social media expert despite my age. <laughs> <And> <laughs> well, it seems like there's like a hundred ways to derail a campaign, right? Like you could, you could just put your foot in your mouth at any opportunity or, uh, I don't know. Uh. Yeah, I mean, I think in a sm small town, I don't know, people feel about, I think of Boulder as a small town in the most loving way. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot more forgiveness for those kinds of things because there is a realization that we're all human, yeah. right? Like yeah. very few people run for city council in Boulder who are like doing it as a career move. A paid professional career politician <laughs> yeah. kind of person. Yeah, I think that's right. That's um, right. They would go for something that pays a little more. Well, good. I hope I hope people are uh, are uh, kind and generous with you as you as you go through the the heart of this the upcoming weeks and months. So um, uh, can you tell us a bit about your uh, work and what you do? Um, so I've done a lot of different things in Boulder. I've worked for um, three different architecture firms in my 10 years here. Um, right now, I work for a firm that sort of specializes in um, modern design and 
so we do a lot of homes around Boulder for the most part. That's kind of our bread and butter. Um, and it's great, you know, we get to spend a lot. I love it because we get to spend a lot of time on design. <laughs> hi, Hazel. <laughs> Hazel, come say hi. Yes. <laughs> okay, just let's, let's watch the, uh, the, the cord. <laughs> Your mom wants you back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, Hazel. Go on. Hazel, I wish you could stay, but but we're busy. All right, where where were we? Uh, you get you uh, you get to work with families all over Boulder, mm -hmm. uh, helping them improve their homes. I, I assume. Yeah. yeah, and you know one of the things I love about um, working at HMH is that we get to spend a lot of time doing really high quality design and focusing on. Um, you know, the really creative, fun parts of architecture. So you said earlier that it's mostly single family homes. Uh, I, I hope, I assume maybe you would, you, you would like also to do multifamily projects, but uh, is there much opportunity for that sort of thing? So typically firms focus on sort of a specific thing. I mean, a lot of firms do a lot of different things, but everyone kind of has like their specialty. Um, I don't know that HMH's specialty is ever going to be multifamily homes, but um, I, I have worked for firms before. I used to work for Caddis Architects and I've done um, with them, I did a fairly big project with Boulder Housing Partners. Um, so I love um, so, uh one of the things we uh, briefly talked about, talking about, is uh, just sustainability and architecture and 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 design for um, uh, you know to make to make cities more beautiful. So maybe uh, uh, do you want to um, give us a positive vision of like uh, how we could build better houses in Boulder, or or maybe improve the the codes in in uh, meaningful ways. Mm. So I think that um, Boulder is doing a good job, mostly in terms of our code, where um, the, our energy code is one of the most restrictive in the country. Um, but we are missing some, some key things. So right now, partially because the value of property is so high and people are trying to max out how much they can build within it um, and hit these really high energy targets, it pushes a lot of people towards um, sort of the foam plastic insulations and things like that. And that's pretty damaging in terms of the embodied energy. Um, and when you look at the timeline um, on our climate and, you know, trying not to, trying to avoid the worst of climate change, when you're using products like that, you're releasing all of that global warming potential right away, right when the building is built. You know, that's all sort of baked in. And so, yes, over a hundred year time period, that building is more efficient, but do we really have um, the capacity right now to be releasing all of that um, global warming potential in this moment? And I think that that's something um, we really need to look at and figure out better practices around and ways to restrict. So just like uh, changing, changing codes around which materials you use, for example. I think there's a number of things like that. So um, the way we heat our houses, the whole sort of natural gas, electricity question, we're, do, we're making progress on that. The city is pushing more towards um, just electrifying. Mm -hmm. And one of the benefits of that is that as our grid improves, everyone's homes naturally improve at the same time. And so kind of keeping in mind the, the long range implications of these choices that we're making is really important. Interesting. Well, um, one of the things that comes, that brings to mind for me is, um, okay, so we're, we're sitting here um, at, uh, at the juncture of Greenbrier and Lehigh. I can't think of the name of this park if it has a name. I think but it's just like Shanahan Ridge Park. Shanahan Ridge Park. And um, I actually used to live over here um, in, in one of these units. And um, it had electric floorboard heating mm. and very poor insulation. I always mm -hmm. felt bad like I was just like burning coal to, to uh, 
to heat this house that wasn't insulated very well. Um, I know that the, our grid now is mostly, it's all natural gas, uh, I think, uh, electricity generated. I suppose there's solar power coming in from, from south, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, our grid is very large and yeah. complicated yeah, and takes sorry, energy from a lot of different places. But yes, we did close our, or phase out our local coal plant. Right. So, um, but uh, what, why is it that someone can rent a house over here without really insulating? I mean, it used to be one of these situations where the frost would collect on the on the window, and you know, you're running these electric floorboards, and the the, the expense for the electricity was in, incredible. Um, anyways, <laughs> <laughs> how can the city let that happen? Yes. <laughs> Um, I mean, we do have an energy requirement now for rental units. Okay. So you do have to meet sort of a minimum code that you might not have had to then. Yeah, so may, this was um, maybe six, eight years ago. So, well, um, I know you're not running for city council to uh, to change the, the, the building codes necessarily. I mean, uh, a little <laughs> bit, but... <laughs> um. So, so tell us, maybe uh, give us an a, a elevator pitch of why you're running for city council. So the, there's two main issues that, for me. Um, first is our affordable housing crisis, and the second is our climate crisis. I think the last, you know, COVID and the last year have really, um, and a lot of the research have come out, makes it obvious that there's just so much overlap in those things. Um, there's a lot of other issues that our community is facing, but largely they tie back to affordable housing in my mind. So that really is the foundation of um, what I'm pushing for and why I'm running for council. Cool. So yeah, give us a vision of your uh, of what you would like to see happen with uh, affordable housing. Um, so for me, I think being an architect, I understand the complexities and difficulties of the sort of the challenge that we're up against. So there is no one silver bullet. We're going to have to do a number of different things um, in order to make a big enough dent to really um, see an impact. I think um, sort of on the large scale, um, the big apartment style buildings, you know, I think while our 25% inclusionary housing requirements for new construction are great. Um, I'd also like to see us try and go harder for some of the federal dollars that are available. Right now, our permitting processes, especially if you have to go through a discretionary review, are so lengthy mm -hmm. that we it really takes us out of the running for some of the like LIHTC funding and things that could help um, create incentives for developers to do um, housing that has a really high level of affordability. Yeah, it always seems to me like whenever a, a housing project gets through the system, it's like such a big victory for, <laughs> for the, all the hours and all the effort of the people who, who pushed it through that it's like, I mean, does it really have to be such a big ordeal every time uh, we, we build new housing? I mean, it makes sense to, to me to vet it all and mm -hmm. make sure it's a, it's a sensible um, project for the property that's under proposal. But to me, it, it, it just always seems like, wow, like why does it really have to be quite so difficult? I'm, so one of the things I'd like to advocate for is that we take sort of a bigger picture of the whole city. So some communities, I think New Jersey was one of the first, uh, I think the whole state did this, where they sort of look at the gap between the housing that you have um, and what it would take to sort of meet whatever goal you have. So in our case, it would probably be um, trying to house the majority of our workforce. So if we look at what our housing stock is now and what kind of needs we would need to fulfill to make it so that um, workers could work with reasonably and live within our community, yeah. um, there are economists who can make a model of that and can give us numbers on what yeah. exactly that should look like. And we could divvy it up around town and say like, okay, we're gonna try and make this many units at the, you know, of these types of units at these types of price points yeah. in each portion of town. And then, you know, have community meetings to figure out like, 
what do you want it to look like? You know, yeah. here's what, you know, you know your neighborhood really well. Do you want to see an apartment building? Do you want to do duplexes and triplexes? Like what, what makes sense for this part of town? Well, I really appreciate you, you know, sort of saying that out loud as a candidate, because I know that in the past, it's always been kind of like um, vague, uh, vague understandings that we want a bit, a bit more housing or whatever. But, but what you said is actually pretty radical, right? Like, um, cause, cause if you've started attaching numbers to that, the first thing that comes into my brain is like the 60,000 in commuters um, who uh, who come in every day for daily work. So you're talking about that kind of magnitude of new housing? I mean, I think it's so, you know, first we need to start with exactly what is the goal. As, yeah. the com as a community, we should have a target of who it is that we are really trying to house. Yeah. And then we aggressively go after that target because I think that you can get a lot more buy-in from the community when they realize that, you know, when you have a well-communicated outcome that you're working towards. Yeah. It's not just like, oh, we're going to put a random amount of this in your neighborhood because we feel like it or because you are the people who are least able to keep it out. Sure. You know, so I think having... Um, intention and agreement that this is a community goal that we want to work towards and then um, really equally sharing um, both the opportunity and um, the burden of what that is. Yeah, or perceived burden or in a lot of, yeah. <laughs> in I a mean, lot of cases. I mean, yeah, pe people, um, obviously this conversation is really going to raise the hackles of, of, what, of what we might uh, call a NIMBY. Uh, uh, Nicole scolded me a little bit for using that phrase, but uh, it, feels, it feels apt in this, moment, <laughs> in this moment. You know, people who don't want their, their neighborhoods to be denser. So, like, how do, you, how do you get around that kind of reflexive rejection of more housing? I mean, again, I, I sort of believe in people. I think yeah. that... Um, we all, like every single one of the candidates right now is talking about how much we need affordable housing. I don't think that there's any, any denial that this is a huge issue that our community faces. And I think that we can tie that to, you know, like we, people want their children to be able to live in this community. People, you know, we need to have, in order to attract the best teachers for our schools, we need to have housing for them. I think that, you know, it's important that we communicate why we want this and what makes sense, but, um, and, and also to give people choice in the solution. Like, yeah. it, if you don't, like, like I say, when we sort of present, like, here's what it would take to tackle the problem, we do make that a community discussion. So it's not like, oh, the city, you know, city council has decided you're going to get a quadplex next to your single family home. No, I mean, I think we're looking at, um, what makes sense for your community and how, you know, because there are going to be places nearby that are on transportation hubs that density feels better. And there's going to be places where it really makes sense to keep, um, to have less density that, because it's not as bikeable, it's not as walkable. And, yeah, and further, that'll- Further away from the city core, for example. That'll change over time, um, but- well, so, making sort of a long-term plan so that we're not looking at each time we build a building asking all of these questions. Like, we don't need to relitigate this every time. We should sort of have a long-range plan that we largely agree upon. Yeah, so that, I was going to circle back on that because the, the way you framed um, this increase in housing actually feels like, uh, like a lot of individual decisions that take a lot of time. Um, Whereas if, if we just made zoning changes, and I, maybe, that's, maybe that's where you're heading with this, if we made zoning changes, then people can by right just build out to whatever the zoning code allows for. And then, and then it's not really so, you know, like we got to get all the neighbors together to agree that it's okay for me to have a, a, a duplex. So are, are you really, what you're proposing is, is zoning changes or uh, something more, uh, uh, I guess the zoning has to, has to, be flexible and has to change if you're going to accommodate the kind of housing you're talking about. Right. I mean, I think that we can't of, you know, 80% of our residential land area is single family 
zoning. We can't avoid touching all of it um, and meet the goals that we've sort of agreed to as a community that we want to tackle. I, um, I can think of a lot of different ways that we can go about solving this, but I do. Th the important part is that we need to get um, community buy-in in order to move forward with these projects. And it would be better if we could get community buy-in, um, not in a just one-off kind of way. Yeah. We need to make a, a plan for the future that um, we can continue to move forward with that will allow th for smoother progress in the future. Well, um, <laughs> one of the things that, that sort of irritates me about that answer is like, I, I don't want to do this in the future. Like I want to, I, when, I, when the city council uh, convenes in January, I kind of want you guys to hit the ground running and start, and start uh, you know, for one thing, getting out of the way of the city manager and, the, and our Boulder Valley comprehensive plan values and, and, and start letting some of this stuff move forward. Um, and, uh, and like, I want to start like, you know, acting like the climate crisis is upon us, you know, not like vague ideas for the future. And I'm not saying like what you're saying is vague, but, but in the, in the answer you gave, it's a bit hand wavy. So, <laughs> um, yeah, there are no silver bullets. We got to do it all. So, I mean, I think that one of the concrete things that coming that's coming up is that there is a zoning update that will probably um, happen right at the beginning of the when the next council is seated. Yep. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, we need to look at um, making reasonable adjustments to try and be more in line with our comp plan values, probably. and especially because I would like to see us um, tie some of that increase in density um, or option for increase to uh, affordability, to, you know, long-term affordability, whether that's land trusts or um, deed restrictions. But the idea that you could potentially get a little bit more density if you sign, you know, if you permanently restrict things, I think is really one of the something we have to do yeah. if we're really yeah. trying to fix this problem for the future. From the climate perspective, um, it really makes sense to, you know, um, make it much more attractive and much more, um, really more, the, the, the more convenient choice to have car light living uh, in, in a lot of the places throughout the city and, and allow density for the sake of having more people that can live without cars. Um, one of the things that, that sort of horrifies me about the, the prospect of more housing is just more cars. And so if, if as we go, we're always, we're always thinking about um, the fact that, that one of the reasons we're doing this is, is to help m mitigate our climate carbon impact. And um, so I would just like to see as our, as our population increases, our, our, the number of cars that we have go down and, I don't know, maybe that's a way to really sell uh, housing to people who don't want it in their communities. If, if we can somehow say like, there, there'll be less, there could actually be less traffic, more foot traffic, more cycling traffic, less right. car traffic, less parking perhaps. Well, and I think that's, you know, the reason that you want to focus the density on um, transit hubs and things like that is for the environmental impact, but it's also the livability. Like, um, from an urban design standpoint, you can make those places really vibrant and wonderful, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, and so you get this wonderful overlap between um, making the air, making it more everyone's lifestyle more sustainable, but also making it more enjoyable. Yeah. I mean, I strongly believe that. I mean, I live, I live in an area that's slightly dense for a reason, not super dense, yeah. but, yeah. Um, you know, that I think there's a lot of value to living in a community where you have sort of that tight neighborhood connection and where you share things like the community garden and the swimming pool and the shared resources um, gives you more 
than you would have otherwise. Yeah, well, so well, it's worth pointing out that in the walk from your unit to this park, we stopped and talked with three different neighbors and petted several dogs and we got interrupted by a dog here earlier. And um, I mean, people are great. You know, we love people. <laughs> we want to we wanna live in, in communities where we look after each other and say hi to each other, greet each other. Um, one of the things I love about this particular community is um, it's like you're really aware of how special the open space is mm -hmm. uh, because uh, just just looking over there you we can see all the way past El Dorado Springs to the to the um, I guess that's that's um, I'm not sure what that ridge is but it, I mean I think if you were on the top of that ridge you'd be able to see Rocky Flats from there yeah absolutely yeah. Um, and so yeah I, um, yeah I feel really lucky I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't move if I had the option to. <laughs> um, I, uh, between having the open space and then having the skip that comes skip around, too, yeah, um, it's like the perfect amount of access to urban and access to yeah. open space. And th th I think that's really, you know, Boulder has set aside all of this open space and that's like part of the benefit is that you get to have this vibrant um, community with all this amenity space. And so we're, we're set up perfectly to like make these really, really wonderfully rich communities. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I, I, love, um, I love the skip here and I wish that my neighborhood had something equivalent coming through it, but my neighborhood's so, um, Right, you know, the, where I live right now, it's, I'm kind of in between Baseline and Table Mesa. And so I have to walk a half a mile either way to get to a, a regular route. Um, but uh, so I miss, I miss having that ability to just hop on the bus, go down to Southern Sun or someplace here at the corner and take it back up or go downtown. The skip is very nice for, for those trips downtown. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, that will all improve as we get denser, you know, and have and accommodate more people because uh, they, just the way the economics of transit, yeah, uh, you know, you have to have you have to have people that that want to ride and, and that you know enough density to support it. And I think it's important to bring up that um, you know even if we didn't do this, the community doesn't stay the same. We're actually, we're changing all the time regardless. Cities are never static. So, you know, in the last three years, we've been seeing a population decline. Mm -hmm. um, my office, which is right across the street from Boulder High, has become a significantly less walkable place. We lost a grocery store, a pharmacy. I mean, it, um, we aren't really able to support right now some the ability to have the things that make our communities really walkable. Um, and I think that when we look at adding a little bit of density in places, it's important to do that in a way that encourages those 15 minute neighborhoods and that really, you know, uplifts the lives of everyone. Yeah. Well, I have a question about, um, about that. Um, when you, when you walk around this neighborhood, do you have, uh, do you have any imagination about, how you might change it in terms of the housing here or, or um, any kind of multi-use, like a, like a corner store or anything like that. I mean, I guess it doesn't, it doesn't quite seem like there would be enough critical mass to support that, but. No, but I mean, we do have the skip and the trails. I always think of there's, um, there's a house by one of the trailheads that um, is a little bit in disrepair. One of my friends brought this up one day as like, wouldn't be, that be great if that got remodeled and turned into a cafe? Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, right at the beginning of the trailhead, that would be oh, such sure. a wonderful thing for this community. Yeah. Um, so small tweaks, I would love to see just, you know, yeah. Yeah. the Alpine Modern Cafe is so nice down um, uh, sort of by the university. People used to do these things all the yeah, time. Right, right. And so that's, you know, everything old is new again, right? Yeah, like yeah. A, a lot of what I want to advocate for is just um, 
using these smart ideas that we've used as cities in the past to make our communities um, really wonderful and figure out how we can implement those sort of in our modern communities to bring back some of that fabric. How do you feel about the housing at uh, Boulder Junction? Does that, does that inspire you or does it kind of depress you or is it neither here nor there? I mean, we were talking about this earlier. I think that um, a lot of the Boulder processes are really good at getting rid of um, the solutions that we most want to avoid. And they also kind of squish the, you know, most exciting forward thinking kinds of things that people are doing in architecture. Pushes those out. It pushes those out. You get, you end up sort of with the middle. Yeah. Um, and so in general, there's a lot of the building that we're doing in Boulder is not all that inspiring, but I think that it can still be very important. Sometimes people get too caught up on, um, you know, tweaking, which is funny, I'm on the design advisory board, right? But like, for real, we need to pay, make sure that we're always paying attention to what the building is used for. Like, that's always the most important thing is yeah. like, who does this serve? Is it good for our community? Is it creating, is it filling a need that we have? And then beyond that, let's make it look good. Thank you for serving on the, uh, what did you call it? The, the design advisory the, the board. The design advisory board. I appreciate your, your service, but what do you do? <laughs> on, on that? I, guess I, I guess I don't appreciate it because I don't know what you do, <laughs> but I'd like to. So the design advisory board, we, it's funny because we never typically see projects under our purview. It was originally created to look at projects in the downtown area with exterior improvements over $25,000, okay. um, but we don't end up seeing any projects that landmark board, that the landmarks board sees. So that limits the amount of, a significant amount of downtown. Um, so typically we only review projects that are brought by um, city staff, planning board, or city council. And so when they are reviewing a project and think that it could use a little extra help, they often um, send it our way. So uh, I'm kind of curious about like the moment you decided to run for city council. Like what 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 is the what, what was like a tipping point for you in terms of thinking about actually tackling this? So I always watch city council elections pretty closely. It has a big you know impact on what kinds of changes we're going to make in terms of building and zoning and things like that. So I always, I often joke that it's my football. <laughs> <laughs> you go to city council meetings frequently or, or occasionally? Yeah, and as I watch them a lot online. Uh -huh, yeah. um, and of course, if I can't watch them, I read the tweets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I've always been um, interested and then serving on a city board, you know, I was paying attention to who might run this time, and um, it felt like there was, it was a little short. They didn't have a ton of candidates who are interested, um, and I wasn't really planning on running, but after talking to a couple people, it sort of seemed like... Possible, like, or reasonable. Well, and, I, and I'm always looking for candidates who are strong sort of on the urban design side and on social issues because that doesn't always, there's not always a lot of overlap there. Luckily, I think this time um, we have a lot of candidates that are that way. But, um, and so it was like, we don't have a full slate. We need some more people, uh, you know, that like yeah. who, who all is gonna run this year. And um, so I volunteered. That's good, very cool. <laughs> it is, um, takes a lot to run and a lot of you know it, in a lot of ways it is a sign of privilege you know it is and that's really unfortunate I think sure. that um, I am able to run and that's part of why I chose to yeah. 
I appreciate that. Yeah, I'd be, um, so I assume one of the things that you're interested in looking at is um, uh, fair pay for city council. Not for me, but for sure, but, but like just changing that to make that sure that other level. people are able to run. I yeah. mean, I think that um, you, you know, we had ten candidates um, at the forum, and you'll notice that we don't have a lot of minority candidates running. We don't have, um, you know, we're largely all homeowners. There's, we're not f matching the demographics of our town. And I think that that is problematic and is something that we should address. Um. Yeah, I mean, just th thinking about it, you know, like the possibility of running, it's like you either have to be a, a complete workaholic to, to maintain a full-time job and do uh, city council, which uh, some estimates I've heard is up to 30 hours a week, or um, uh, you have to have a way to just be able to dedicate, you know, like the, the sort you had, you must be kind of like a, a person of leisure, you know, <laughs> that can just dedicate that kind of time, so. Um, or a balance of both. I'm kind of going for the yeah. like not working full-time, sure. but. Yeah. Well, that's great if you can. Also, work, so. trying to do enough to make it all happen without losing my mind. Totally, totally. Well, I, I um, good luck with all the balancing of that. <laughs> Are you a fast reader? No, not particularly. Because <laughs> Aaron Brockett told me that you know it's like. The, the packets, the weekly packets are like 500 pages. I hope there's a lot of graphics in those packets. <laughs> like, you know, get a pie chart, next page, <laughs> you know. Uh, cool. Well, um, I, do you want to talk about, um, maybe we should just touch on uh, the demographics of Boulder and touch on, uh, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, mm -hmm. What are... I guess obviously our biggest challenge there is, is housing and allowing people to to live where they work, but what else is on that list? There are a lot of people working on um, diversity and equity issues in our community, and I think that, you know, as a city council member, <laughs> it would be really important to reach out and make sure that we're supporting the work that's happening in our community. I mean, if we if we can't have a representational council, we need to at least make sure that we're, because there are people of color in our community that are doing really great things yeah. um, and have leadership roles that um, and doing the community outreach already. And so it's important for us to make sure that we are helping lift up those leaders that already exist in our community. Awesome. How are you feeling about um, uh, policing and social services and and uh, those kinds of things. So I went to school in Oregon, in Eugene, um, where the CAHOOTS program was started. I don't know about the CAHOOTS program. So the CAHOOTS program is like an emergency mental health um, outreach program. So basically when you call 911 there, mm -hmm. you know, you can have the police respond, the fire department respond, an ambulance, but you can also get these um, mental health and service providers that sort of that are doing emergency response. And so part of why that hap was happening in Eugene is that um, they had a lot of, it's a budget issue, you know, police are really expensive, yeah. but also so is they, jail. <laughs> <laughs> so is jail. They don't provide the best outcomes, jail either. Yeah. Um, and so I'm a strong believer in the fact that um, we need to really address the problems in our community, not just um, police them into not existing. I think that which provide, doesn't work, which, doesn't work. which doesn't work, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we've, been work, we've been trying that. It's not very successful. Um, and it is both better for our community and more affordable for us to do the right thing. And whenever you have those opportunities where, like, you get those great overlaps, you just have to go that direction. Like, yeah, there's no right. other, yeah. <laughs> we, there's no other reasonable response. So I think that I would really love um, to see us 
institute a program like CAHOOTS. Denver just um, started the STAR program, which is based off of that. So, I interviewed Jen Livovich mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago, and she said that you can always call um, uh, the, not, the police for a non-emergency and, and do a, a, a wellness check or a, 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 like a health check. But after we were talking, after we after we were done with the, the interview, she kind of she kind of backtracked on that a bit because she was like, you know, you, you can do that, but the standard for admittance to like um, to, uh, um, uh, to to for an overnight psychiatric care of some sort is just so high that really like there's not much point in calling for almost anyone you would see that's still like able to walk and interact with you you know mm -hmm. so that that yeah. kind of that was kind of discouraging because like um i just don't know how to help people like as a as a, nor a normal citizen but i wish i lived in a community where like collectively we knew how to help you know like i could i could initiate a phone call and it would activate the right kind of services to help a person in need in this moment rather than like i just feel like you know, there's something there's something that sort of feels sick inside of me where I have to just sort of ignore someone who's stressed out yeah. or I have to like like completely like rearrange my day or my week or like I don't even know like if I just decided I was going to help somebody that needed help, what would I do? Or you just might not have the skills to really provide anything uh, meaningful. I mean, not. like I'm not a mental health professional. Oh, yeah. I um there's only so much that I can provide when someone is in crisis. Yeah. yeah, no, I think we do have a program where the police are providing some of those services. But again, I think that's um, not quite the right answer because you're still asking the police department to do something that is really not within the scope of what they're trained for. I mean, yes, they're bringing in some outside people to help them do it better, but they're, they're making the situation more risky potentially um, in some ways by being there because the, there is a tendency, um, I think, for situations to escalate in the presence of police, certain kinds of situations. Um, and so... That's part of why having um, a separate response team is really important. Not only are they better trained, but they, you know, they can de-escalate those situations. And CAHOOTS talks a lot about how they, um, while they will call in police if it's necessary, they really reduce the number of incidents that um, the police get called in for. And I think that that you know, police officers are really expensive. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and we're having a hard time hiring them in our community right now. Um, and part of that is because of what we're asking them to do for their jobs, in my opinion. That's just a guess. But I think that, you know, police officers probably don't want to be mental health service providers. Well, um, I guess, I, yeah, I'm, I don't know anything about that um, in terms of, like, specifically why Boulder's having difficulty hiring people but I would guess that other communities are probably also having similar um, uh, issues with with hiring and retaining uh, top-notch police staff because um, I wouldn't think that Golden for example would be like a lot different in terms of what they're asking their police force to to, to do but or, or is there are there differences between cities so um, homelessness tracks really closely to the rate of increases in home prices. So I think that you will see that communities like ours, where home prices are increasing really fast, yeah. that we have um, a larger um, homeless population. And while mental health services and homelessness aren't always, you know, there's people are homeless for a variety of different reasons. Largely housing costs. Lack of, lack of housing being one. <laughs> being yeah. the main one. Being unhoused can exacerbate a lot of um, yeah. other issues. And so I think that we probably are seeing 
more of that in our community than some neighboring communities, largely because of our house housing costs. Housing is the answer to everything. Housing is really a focal point for so so many things. Like, uh, uh, like I, I, for you know, like like this thought exercise I often like to do is um, is like what kind of housing would we have to build to to get to set you know to help to to solve that uh, the homeless crisis in Boulder County mm. and in Boulder the city of Boulder in particular and um, I just you know like I think I think people have this mindset of like well I don't want a bunch of homeless people living next to me and I my, my kind of glib response is well they wouldn't be homeless <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like if we build housing for people to live in you and know they're housed. they're housed and and you just think about all you know just psychologically how much weight that comes mm -hmm. off of i mean i know it's not like an instant fix there's all kinds of reasons why people um struggle with mental health um but gosh i mean like if you could house if you could start by housing them uh it, that feels like a huge um a huge thing to, to to do as a society and like we ought like as as the self-respecting community and, and people, you know, like mm -hmm. people who want to exude love and, and care for the planet. And um, it seems like it's such a basic thing that we ought to do. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, the, I largely agree with our housing first policy. I think that, you know, the idea that we should be putting the bulk of our um, resources into trying to house people is a really, um, strong idea. I do think that our community has decided that that is not an acceptable solution <laughs> that we have to do because um, clearly we're not housing everybody right now. Um, and so what do you do um, in that stopgap situation to kind of try and um, do as much as you can for as many people as possible? And so I think that well, I'd love to see us just house everyone. In the meantime, I think that we need to look at um, sort of what alternative options are available. Right now, you know, our shelter is fairly restrictive and we've recently um, eliminated the six month residency requirement. So I suspect that this winter we'll see um, that probably at capacity. Most of the time. A lot of the time so I think that we probably need to be looking at um, additional sheltering options um, and and I think that's an opportunity because the our existing shelter doesn't make sense for all people you know I think that um, looking at different at-risk populations um, within the community of people who are currently unhoused is a really important thing so that we can um, you know, address their unique situations to help su adequately support them in finding housing and <laughs> living their lives. One of the things that uh, came up in the conversation with Dan Williams was just that, um, you know, um, if you could live in a car light neighborhood, and a lot of people do, I, I, want, I want to live in a place where I don't need a car. Um, uh, there's a lot of expense associated with that car ownership that mm -hmm. is eliminated. And I feel like a lot of people that are currently unhoused, you know, um, I don't know, may, a lot of us want to drive around and, and need to drive around. And I don't mean to, um, to, to say what different people want or need, you know, but um, I would think that there would be part of the homeless demographic if they could just live downtown in a, in a place that didn't require a car, that would be such a big improvement over living without a car or a, an apartment uh, downtown, <laughs> you yeah. know. And um, yeah, that's it. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's not a question. <laughs> yeah, where do you go with that? It's not a question. But uh, do you... Do you uh, um, do you have a car and do you drive? <laughs> I do have a car. Um, I don't like driving, yeah. so I avoid it if I can, which 
works pretty well. I love, you know, another thing I love about my office is its location downtown because yeah. I can, once I bike to the office, everything is really within bikeable range for me. Including City Hall, which will be convenient <laughs> for your evening job. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's where um, the design advisory board yeah, meets already. Of so. Yeah. Well, so uh, I never really asked you about transportation. We touched on it yes. earlier, uh, but uh, you want to tell us about what you're what you're excited about changing in the city of Boulder with related to, to transportation. I mean, the key to transportation is housing, <laughs> <laughs> but beyond that, um, I, you know, we are living in a time of changing technology, and so I'm really excited to see. Um, us start to look at vehicles differently, more sharing, um, and also the e-bikes and electric buses. I think that there's um, just so many good things happening, and I think it's important that as a community we're really um, looking at what the future might be and trying to um, prepare the best way we can for that. Yeah. So I think that, you know, are we going to see a need to, or the opportunity to change some of these parking lots that we have required um, into something else in the future? I hope so. Um, because we will have shared cars and we, you know, we will just need less of that resource. So I think starting to look at um, how we're doing development proposals to put us in the best situation um, so that we can be ready for that change and encourage that change. Well, yeah, and I, I um, as someone who used to live up here without a car, um, we, we actually had this um, month long experiment with, with my wife and I with our kids. Didn't We didn't have a car up here, we used a skip and having an e-bike to get up the hill, this it's last life hill, changing. Is, is, it is life changing. You really don't need a car, even even though we're like, you know, four miles from downtown, something like that, we're more like five miles. I yeah, remember. I think it's about um, five. But between the bus and the e-bikes and mm -hmm. you know the car, there's a car shared uh, down mm -hmm. in the corner at the at Table Mesa. It's not super convenient, but it's a I, we far. actually we actually used it quite a lot. So it, when when we needed it, we would either bike down to go grab it, or we'd take the skip down and, and then drive back up. It's a, it was a little uh, rigmarole, but. Um, Car shares are, are great. Like, yeah. um, I like driving other people's cars that are like, I don't, I don't I have like to maintain. I like not maintaining <laughs> exactly. that car. <laughs> exactly. exactly. No, I mean, I've never, I'm, I have the car share thing too. I have never used the one at the grocery store here, but um, I use the one at my office. It makes it so I can bike to work. And if I have a meeting uh -huh. that pops up where I have to go to Denver or something, I, you know, they have a bunch of, um, rental there there's a number of cars you can yeah. check out in that area yeah for sure yeah i've used some of those too and so that makes it so that i don't have to worry about biking to work which is yeah. really nice yeah cool um well yeah that's great i uh and i man i i every time i can get someone to try an e-bike for the first time i really like try to uh, cajole them into doing that because I have the most architecty e-bike and so people always see it and they're like oh what is that and I just I always try and talk people so into what is that what does that mean what's an architecty e-bike <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll have to show it to you but um uh it doesn't look like an e-bike like oh. all the battery the motor it's all it's hidden oh. um and and it's all black and all the cool. wires and stuff are all running internally in the frame yeah, uh, there's like no controls it's very sleek it's very cool yeah um i just love you know putting somebody on an e-bike and um so often they had this uh verbal reaction like oh you know like they like literally yes. um, have a little um shout for joy and um man i i just feel like you know um i un i understand the appeal of a tesla it's a nice looking car but i um, really like to get a high-end electric assist bike is way cheaper than a Tesla, and it's so much more thrilling. Even mine is not a high-end bike, but yeah. it is, oh, yeah. I just keep hitting my mic. It's so much fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not saying you have to have, I mean, I had an entry-level one for a very long time. Yeah. It was, it was really, uh, I put a ton of miles on it, and uh, it, it was still thrilling. Um, so yeah, I'm all for e-bikes.
Another favorite subject of mine is uh, bedrooms are for people. Uh, do, do you endorse, yes. did you sign the petition? Do you endorse bedrooms are for people? I signed the petition the first time around. I actually missed it the <laughs> second time around, but um, I do support bedrooms are for people and I'm happy that it's going to be on yeah. the ballot. I, uh, you know, I know that a lot of people are sort of talking about the unintended consequences um, right now. And I think that you know, it's really important to recognize that there are a lot of unintended consequences to these occupancy limits. Yeah. I mean, or intended. Yeah, or, or intended. Um, again, I went to school in Eugene, Oregon, where there are no occupancy limits. Um, it's a college town, very similar in size, with a similarly sized university. Um, and I lived in a house with eight architects um <laughs> happy memories i'm sure <laughs> it was wonderful um and we were good neighbors <laughs> you were good neighbors to the people next to you you mean yes. yeah yeah not to each other i meant yeah right. <laughs> yeah that's what they say right like if you're living illegal you're not a great neighbor because you're trying to stay under the radar avoid eye contact you know whenever you have rules like that that are going to be unequally enforced um you know, that is always an equity issue. For sure. Who is going to get, um, who is going to bear the brunt of those types of regulations and who needs the protection, yep. I think is, um, even if you don't believe in the economic side of it, which I, I think you should, um, just for those sort of issues of making our community more, um, more welcoming and yeah. equal. Well, one thing I've been thinking about lately is, is, is like, there's like kind of this relentless economic argument right now against bedrooms are for people. And I, two of my responses are like, I haven't heard a cogent argument that says, well, it's, it's also bad for the climate and it's also bad from a social justice perspective. I guess, I guess the economic does bleed into the social justice angle, but, um, but you look at who, you know, who are the organizations that are supporting this. And I think you could say that, like, right. if, yeah. those, if those are the nonprofits that are supporting Bedrooms Are For People. But, but uh, one thing, one, one response that I have that feels kind of glib is that, well, you know, Bedrooms Are For People may pass and housing prices may go up um, even still. And in fact, all indications are we're, we're just like, we are just on a trajectory where um, the, the disparity between demand and, and supply just keeps growing. And um, I, you know, so like, but, but <laughs> you, you can't, it's really hard to argue that the occupancy restrictions have done a good job of, of um, helping housing prices stagnate or decline, you know, it's like, it's, that's an absurd argument. And so it hasn't like, worked in the past 30 years like, that we've had them. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm not super hopeful that that you know um housing is somehow going to be much more affordable because the bedrooms are for people but i'm i really think it's an important step step to take anyways for a, a wide variety of reasons right um, yeah and even if yeah it just gives people more flexibility i mean that's a big part of it right is if you have a lot of people who are sort of on the edge right yep. um and having those occupancy limits really restricts their ability to use their own networks to help them find solutions. Yeah. Or, I mean, to like, if you own a house and you're having troubles making those ends meet, right. you know, now you'll be able to sign a contract that to rent out that room that's legit and, that, and both parties can feel good about it and not feel like they're living on the edge. Right. Right. So, so, so it's like, I think it, it just does so much for people who really, you know, deserve a little bit of a break. Yeah. Um, yeah. And for that reason alone, I think that it's definitely worth doing. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, supporting that. Um, uh, do you, uh, do you have any other uh, final thoughts, parting before shots you'd like to, yeah, before, it starts, to, before it starts pouring rain on us? Before it starts pouring rain? We did get a nice, like, yeah, I, sh I felt like at some point I should have just turned the camera around and shown like how beautiful it was. It was such a nice evening. Anyways, thank you for taking time to sit and visit with me and tell us about, you know, who you are and what you what you value. I felt like I learned a lot.
Thanks. <laughs> I really appreciate that you're doing this, all the conversations you're having in our community. I love like getting to hear all the different people that are doing really cool things. It's yeah. yeah. yeah and, and it just, it, I think it is shaping the dialogue of um, sort of what, what is acceptable and where what we might do to sort of tackle these issues and i think that's really important cool cool well i'm uh, it, it's, it's been really a, a pleasure interviewing you tonight thank you so much thank you this episode of sharing boulder was produced by david adamson and philip ogren sound and video editing was done by philip ogren the intro music was sampled from osladum by gilberto gill and is available for use under the Creative Commons Sampling Plus license. Please visit us at sharingboulder.us for show notes and previous episodes. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support us by sharing this episode with your friends and family. Keep sharing, Boulder!